Um, I would love to bring that back. Maybe one day we will. Well, we're kind of going to recreate it in this hour because um, it, it, the idea was that we would pick a theme and people in the small business community particularly would ring in and ask advice, basically, um, from all sorts of different people, um, predominantly Emma Jones from Enterprise Nation, but many others as well, including Emma Sinclair, who's joining us this hour as well, entrepreneur, chief executive of Enterprise Alumni. Great to see you back. Thanks, Ian. And we also have Craig Beaumont with us, chief of external affairs at the Federation of Small Businesses. Welcome to you, Craig. Thank you. Um, now... What, what I'm particularly interested in is the prospects for small business in 2023 and the challenges that small businesses face in 2023, because I suspect that given the challenges that they've had to face over the past two or three years with COVID, with Brexit and all sorts of different things, um, that there are new challenges and partly due to rising costs. I suspect that's one of the biggest challenges and particularly in the energy sector. And of course, this week, Craig, you've, you've been very outspoken. You've accused the government of being irresponsible. Just explain why. Uh, because they've moved from a really good energy scheme, which took a lot of the huge rise we've seen in energy prices due to the Putin invasion of Ukraine. And it took a lot of that away uh, by controlling the wholesale price. And they've completely ditched that. There is no longer a business energy cap. There is a consumer cap. There's not a business one. Uh, and the replacement is a pittance. So at the moment, if you were to get a... Uh, if you're on a fixed deal, fixed at 75p because you fixed last summer uh, per kilowatt hour for electricity, uh, your government's going to come in and move that down to 73p. Uh, before, under the old scheme, it was 21p and fixed. So this is huge. This is economic vandalism. The the, the bit that has kept this um, sector going all the way through this, the winter was knowing that energy bill support would still be there and in March it disappeared. But energy costs are coming down anyway. If you look at the price of uh, gas, you look at the price of oil. I mean, surely you can't expect the government and the taxpayer to fork out endless amounts of money. That would have to come to an end at some point. But you need to plan. And if you're a consumer, you can now plan knowing what your energy costs will be. If you're a business, you can't because you're no you longer never insulated. Been, you never have been able to. No, but there's the consumer cap. There is not a business cap. So the, at the moment, with the bit with business community from the 31st of March you will get 2p off whatever that price comes. So if Putin does anything in Ukraine and the energy prices go up, you're not insulated. So there's no longer certainty there. Meanwhile, if you fixed, as the government encouraged you to do in the summer last year, on a 75p rate, you will go straight back up to that after March the 31st. There are huge bills heading the way of small businesses. And that's because it, it's completely... Well, it, the, the regulation has gone... You also have standing charges, which are completely unregulated. So businesses are going to face rocketing energy bills. And we're back to exactly where we were this time last year. And in terms of the different sectors that we're talking about here, I mean, this is not going to hurt everybody, but it will hurt. Well, I suppose maybe it will, but it's particularly going to hurt businesses that are energy intensive. Uh, I, I wouldn't use the, word, the phrase energy intensive because that means someone who takes a lot. So the, the government's looking after them and giving them three quarters of a million pounds each to make sure they're OK, because apparently it's less easy to pass on the cost to the consumers. But everybody else, so uh, a hotel, a restaurant, anyone who heats, a light, heats and lights their premises, anyone who uses an oven, anyone who uses a freezer, anyone who uses aircon, we're in this wonderful radio studio. I can imagine the energy bills here are pretty high. Um, don't don't, all, don't all these, say that because I'll switch it off. All the... <laughs> all, all of those businesses, hospitality, retail, everyone, it's going to be right across the economy. We've lost half a million businesses over COVID, over two years. And our concern is that looking forward, we should be looking at growth. We should be looking at how do you come out from recession? And yet the government is starting off the year with a really bad note. Emma, anything to disagree with that? Well, it's not disagreeing. Maybe it's just a slight reality check, bearing in mind that I am not just on the side of small business, but when I started my journey, I had no money and no employees. And I spend a lot of time talking to startups, people who have businesses that are tiny uh, kitchen table operations. Um, there is a subsidy. It's obviously less this year than it was last year. Um, sadly, the government can't perpetually subsidise in the same way as you said, Ian. Um, there are obviously indeed huge bills that are heading the way to small business, um, but it's slightly inevitable um, that that's going to happen. And um, I think what we have to look at is how can we make that better? Entrepreneurs are by nature very optimistic people. So when I hear that, it doesn't mean that I don't realise the reality of those bills you're talking about, but I'm like, what can we do about it other than subsidising? We need to sort out insulation in buildings. Yes, we need exactly. to be more energy efficient. Um, but unfortunately, um, there is a subsidy. What you're saying is it's not enough. 
Um, and, and there are fiscal realities about the budget. I run a business where there's a P&L and it's like, how much is there and how much can you spend? I always go back to that when having these conversations. There is only so much in the pot. But that's, that's the, my point. They're spending £2 billion to spend a few pennies to everyone. Now that £2 billion could have been much better spent on an energy efficiency scheme to help us insulate and protect us against the future. It's about choices with public money. It's not about subsidy. It's about using the money you're spending. The government's about to send £2 billion through, £47 per small business to everyone, and it's not good enough. I mean, it's hard, but you have to be forward-looking. And exactly. ultimately, I mean, I agree. There's lots of things about insulation, and the list is long, I'm with you, but the reality is we are where we are. There is a little bit of a subsidy. What can we do with that and what can yes. we do you know, I, I, I mean, don't think that that I, I don't think that there's a criminality that you're suggesting on the part of the approach by government is fair and that's not because I'm representing in any way the government it's just a reality but the thing yeah. is Craig I suspect whenever the government announced that this subsidy was going to go you would be on the radio criticising it well it depends really because I, d- I never said criminality but I said that it was economic vandalism that's different that's it, is, it is a decision made with the money you have why send two billion to people without any uh, they, even looking at need so businesses that don't need this are going to get it it's a bad subsidy how on earth can you so that's a very subjective exercise too i mean you think about need i recognize that there are some ways to identify super in need but that is you, know, you have to be fair if we did that by need you'd be on the radio saying the way that the uh, the way that people have, have tiered the decision making isn't quite fair and these people are missing out and this region isn't getting what it should and Sorry, I, I thought you just said you wanted the money to go to useful things i'm saying yes turn it on useful things businesses that need it or insulation which you also referenced so i'm agreeing with you but you're just a great back, but it's fine. <laughs> okay, we'll get into a bum fight that here. Took, that took a turn. <laughs> uh, um, so, okay, well, let's let's. Energy is clearly, or energy costs are one of the challenges that are facing small businesses this year. We can all agree on that. So, I want to hear from you out there what your experience is. Are, are these costs actually going to threaten the future of your business? Emma says, "Well, business people are naturally optimistic," and she's right. And often people do find innovative ways to to counter these threats. But how are you going to be able to do that? Because it is a, a huge challenge. But Emma, let's come to you first on this. Mm. What what do you think is the other main challenge this year? Well, I think we all can't get away from the fact that everybody is reflecting on the the economic realities and that certainly in the UK, domestic um, business is suffering. Uh, There's a lot of talk in my community and we service very large businesses about cost cutting, hiring freezes and all of those things that uh, don't really make for uh, exciting hearing when you're running a business and you've got uh, got revenue goals and you've got people's wages to pay. So certainly certainly there's that. On the one hand, I'd say therefore there's a lot of doom and gloom. But on on the other hand, with my optimistic hat on, which is very much my nature, but it's how I've built business is there will be opportunities it doesn't mean before we get onto that that people will not there are not businesses that will suffer i'm so sensitive to that um, but i think the other challenge of course will be hiring freezes spending freezes contracts being cut contracts being reduced and a little bit less money to spend alongside all the obvious sort of domestic issues that uh, the consumers have with I mean, mortgages. is this a real is this because demand in the economy in the consumer economy is reducing. I mean, for example, Amazon have announced that they're closing, was it seven warehouses, yes. 1,200 yes. jobs lost. Now, we've all got used to whatever we think of Amazon. Over the last decade or so, we've all got used to news stories saying Amazon are opening a new warehouse in some remote part of the country mm. and providing another 500 jobs. Well, I thought that was a real indication of of a downturn in consumer demand. Yeah, I mean, unquestionably, we all know that there is a downturn in consumer spending. Um, one of the interesting things for me is that you know I run a sort of um, a mid-size, so we're not a huge enterprise and we're not a tiny, and not a tiny small business. Um, and I always watch either companies that have tons of cash that are aggressively going for, for for markets, like the Amazons, who of course knocked a lot of small businesses out of the market, and a lot of them grow, spend. And then they just slash very quickly when there's a problem. For example, in my world, in the technology community, there are lots of companies that you can see have slashed 40% of their workforce, but a lot of them just hired what might be argued as recklessly or very aggressively and hadn't thought about, well, what if, what if things aren't as wonderful next year? Whereas, for example, speaking for myself, I run a business where if things are really tricky, I would, you know, we, all being well, would have no reason to ever lay anyone off because we think about that. So, yes, those are signs. Yes, clearly there's a, a, a reduction in consumer spending, but perhaps also the Amazons of this world who have been um, aggressively expanding, perhaps too aggressively, then aggressively contract and it sends a very negative message to the market. 
Um, Craig, what are your members telling you about the, the biggest challenges apart from energy costs? Yeah, energy is top. I think number, number two is the consumer economy and just generally demand. We're looking at a recession this year. We have GDP stats due tomorrow, don't we, which will confirm five months of a six-month trigger for that is the moment the recession happens. And I don't want to fetishise that technical definition, but we have a year coming up of no economic growth. Uh, and there's a potential for some economic growth in 2024 if you look at the Bank of England forecasts. So I think I would agree the landscape is not positive. Uh, you've also coming into this headwind of strikes. That's number three issue, I'd say. So the disruption on postal service in particular for small businesses that rely on getting their stuff out. Uh, it was incredibly disruptive before Christmas. So that combined with rail, combined with some of the other strikes which are now going to appear, I think if that starts to be coordinated, that will be a real damaging threat to the economy and take it further I down. guess of course though you know 100% all of those things have been felt by my community I, I guess the message of hope for anyone listening for some of those businesses is, is always get ready for an upturn <laughs> uh, you know I, I, I sound like a sort of radiant uh, <laughs> crazy optimist it's an absolute nightmare but I think there are, the reality is there is less consumer spending the strikes the rail strikes all of those things absolutely it's like what can we do about going forward and but what can you prepare yourself for? whenever there's gloom and doom though whether whenever there's a threat there's always somebody looking to take advantage. Absolutely. There? And, and there must be sectors of the economy that are actually doing all right at the moment. We know the ones that aren't, but I, I mean, from your experience, Craig, what would yeah. you say that are the, the ones that are still motoring ahead? I was going to say it's people being able to spot the opportunity. So you see, you do see innovation in this economy. You do see small businesses leading on uh, research and development, for example. I mean, that scheme looks as though it's going to be cut in March. And we're hoping to bring it back. Uh, but that these are the go these are the doers. These people who go in and change things. They don't join a corporate and they stay in there and they kind of just deliver what you expect. So that's good for public procurement. It's good for science. It's good for all these sectors. Uh, and coming back, I, I, I would I would actually push that further the, than Emma. I actually think that there is a good opportunity for startups. At some point this year, we have lost we've contracted our sector from 5.5 million to 5 million. Um, now I think we can now to start build that back, but that needs people in jobs, uh, people who are outside you mean of the people who are working for small businesses. No, people working people either working jobs like I do at the moment. I'm I'm not an entrepreneur. You both are. Uh, people like me should be I attracted was. away uh, to set up a business. Uh, it's that moment. It's that trigger. Or people who are um, out of the workforce. The eight million people who are outside. They should be thinking. Right. I've been. You know. Maybe they're made redundant. Maybe they've struggled during COVID. But they're going to come back with an idea, and that idea becomes a business and the business takes off and we've seen loads of businesses during the pandemic start up in that way so i think the story of this year could start off badly but then get better as it goes on and um, what, what are the yeah. incentives for people though to really do what craig suggests that they should do at the moment well i think you know anyone who has an entrepreneurial tendency you don't have to be an entrepreneur would say if you can do something better or cheaper or smarter actually a tricky time is the very best time to push out an incumbent so absolutely there's lots of opportunity um I, i've that's what i've done in each of my businesses um the other thing is people can pivot you know during covid i you know i, I often joined LBC and we would talk to businesses that were struggling and of course uh, you know if you couldn't open your restaurant you're in dire straits but there were those people where possible were able to pivot and do home delivery or larger food cooking um, so a hundred percent what is the incentive to do that well I mean there's a couple of things first of all uh, everybody wants to either make money or pay the bills generally speaking so the incentive on uh, the very baseline is survival but actually Perhaps a lot of people I'm speaking to now um, are thinking about, all right, I've come out of COVID. I'm a little bit tired. I've had that malaise where I was thinking of doing something different. I've got an idea. I can just about get myself sort of through the next 18 months if I don't earn too much money. Um, and now might be as good as time as any to start a new business. And that is one of the very many things that we need to happen in order for our economy to recover, obviously. Um, Majid on, uh, sent an Alexa message. You can do that, by the way. Just say, send a comment to Alexa, send a comment to LBC. It's a very dangerous thing, this. <laughs> Innovation. Uh, yeah, wait till you hear this one, though. It was the optimists that were the first ones to die on the Titanic. Mm. That's not a very positive message, is it? No, but maybe it was also the optimist that IP on a stock market or the optimist that built the first tall building or the optimist that, uh, you know, first made telecommunications That's possible. why we have you on, Emma. There we are. <laughs> I mean, I... There is a point here about failure, actually. We're not, we're not great at business failures. No, and actually, absolutely. if you go to other cultures, they're much better. So you want people to go and experiment. You want people to try out new things. And they're not all going to work. I don't know if all your businesses, both of you, have, have always worked. But, How can you, you know, ask that? I know. Of course. I'm <laughs> recklessly successful. Well, 
mine, you know. mine, mine have always worked to the extent that, that, that they've never gone out of business. But have I made a lot of money out of them? No. <laughs> but we have. But we now have uh, um, a small, a former small business owner as chancellor who had failed businesses and then successful ones. We've got one as business secretary. We've got one as small business minister. Foreign secretary. Uh, foreign secretary. James yes, James as well. So I mean, I, I just look at Why this government. Why do they keep introducing all of these anti-business laws then? Well, the hope is that, that these people will now activate and move against what was perhaps from number 10 less pro-business. Well, one can but hope. Right, we are going to go to your calls in a second. Lots of them coming in, 0345 6060 973. I asked you about the challenges facing small business, but let's not just concentrate on the negative side. Let's look to be optimistic. If you're running a business at the moment and it's actually doing rather well, tell, tell us how you are bucking the trend. Because I think we need a bit of optimism, as Emma says. Don't be ashamed to do that because sometimes exactly. people are ashamed to say I'm doing okay and it's not yeah. like failure is not great in the United Kingdom. We're also not great at saying I'm actually quite good at that or doing rather yeah. well. It's almost as if it's arrogant. We want to hear from you. That's right. the challenge. It's 18 minutes past eight. LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. 20 past eight on LBC. We have Emma Sinclair with us from Enterprise Alumni. Craig Beaumont is from the Federation of Small Businesses. And we're asking you about the challenges facing small business in 2023. And if you can be optimistic, are you doing rather well with your business? Right. Andy is in Mill Hill. Hello, Andy. Hello there. Good evening. Thank you very much for taking my call. Very interested to hear your experts' comments. Uh, I'm the principal, managing director, founder, whatever you want to call it, of a fire and security company based in northwest London. We cover Greater London. Uh, we've been trading for about 35 years. And yeah, I'll be optimistic. I'm doing all right. I don't need anybody to get any violins out for me. Okay. The problem I've got is, and all my competitors have got, and uh, I talk to everybody, is we cannot get staff. We are work, working on a shoestring. On a good day, I should employ around about 30 staff. As of this morning, I had five spare vehicles outside my business sitting there. This has got nothing to do with the dreaded Brexit, because by coincidence, not for any reason whatsoever, we didn't actually employ anybody that was outside of the UK, who was uh, bred in the UK, if that's the right term. Everybody seems to have disappeared. This is even including office administration staff, even the recruiters, whether it be whatever the specialist recruiters are, nobody has got anybody on their books. Now, this whole thing about energy bills and everything. So just, like so, just, just before you go on to that, yeah. why is that? Why do you think that is? 
I think that uh, with regards to engineers, I think that the people who were really good, and believe me, over the years, I've had some cracking people working with us. I think they have simply retired. And I did a a four-year apprenticeship over 30, obviously nearly 40 years ago. And shortly after that, within my industry, most of the firms stopped doing apprenticeships and they didn't restart again until the last few years where within my industry there was one of these government trailblazer schemes. But they have only got a few hundred people on these trailblazers and they are doing excellent work, but they have so much trouble recruiting the youngsters and even more mature people to join these trailblazer schemes to learn a trade and to do the work. It is a real, real struggle, and everybody has got the same problem. Well, the simplistic answer to being finding it difficult to recruit, I guess, is to pay better money. But This has got nothing to do with money. It really hasn't. I can sling as much money as I like at it. You cannot get people, even to a point where a few years ago, a lot of PAYE uh, employees went self-employed, became subcontractors for all the obvious reasons, which I don't need to go, go through. Even those people don't seem to be around anymore. No, because of IR35. Yes, but the number of people feels full stop, end of story. There is more demand for, uh, for jobs than there are applicants. Emma. Yes, if I may. Four things. Number one, Ian. Yes, people will move if you offer them more money, but quite often that's not actually the best idea because it means they're probably a super mobile group of people that will then move again and again and again for an extra 20p an hour or pound an hour or whatever it might be. Um, Andy, hi. This is my actual day job, so not 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 uh, into, you know the actual things I do at my desk. I run a company that is entirely focused on talent shortage and how to find talent. Um, yeah. I can't help you. So um, the good news is this isn't a plug for my business, but but it, the good news is I also really understand what you're talking about. Um, a few things. Um, number one, for a small business, you quite often have to look in different places. One of my most recent hires is a young man who served me in Joe and the Juice, and the sixth time he you served me. Do you know Joe and the Juice, the chain that sell those quite expensive juices on the high street? I popped in for a juice, Ian. There is a point to this, bear in mind, as opposed to just telling you about what I like to have at at breakfast time. But the sixth time, a very, very lovely young man uh, really impressed me and upsold me, and I'm not upsellable unless I want to be generally. I was asking what he did, and he just finished his degree. He hadn't sorted something out, and he's one of the best performing people on my junior sales team. So first of all, unfortunately, Andy, I understand, and you do have to look in different places. My day job is about alumni for companies. I'm not, you might have to go to the Joe and the Juice. The second thing is there are a lot of barriers that are unreasonable for a lot of talent that we would all like to have. You talked about engineers, Andy. Um, over the course of the last 12 months, I... I, I created a consortium of about 250 large companies to help Ukrainians initially and then refugees who have skills to find jobs using those skills. So it was specifically focused on people finding jobs commensurate with what they knew how to do. The barrier when they got here was just English. There are 180 dentists, 400 doctors, 120 vets, I could go on forever, that have been on their books for sort of 18 months. Even once you've learned the language, you very often have to re-qualify under the local legislation. There is a three-year wait to re-qualify as a dentist in the United Kingdom. So dentist chains like Portman Dental are desperate to hire all of those people. And because of the body and the backlog, which seems unreasonable, they're having to wait three years to take that test. So those people can't practice. The same with vets. You know, my local medivet, where I take Peanut the cat, who's not very well very often, closed down. And I'm like, how can this possibly be? Everybody needs vets. There aren't enough people. So um, I think on the one hand, you have to look in different places, Andy. On the second hand, on the second part, there are a lot of um, governing bodies of skilled people that seem to be a little bit slow. And that's probably the polite way to put it. Um, and, uh, and the third thing is, unfortunately, imp- not unfortunately, employer brand is very important. Maybe, maybe as a result of being on LBC, there will be a swathe of people who want to go work for Andy and Mill Hill. Well, we will pass them on if mm. they do. Listen, Andy, I know you want to talk about energy, but I've got such more calls here, so I'm going to move on. Uh, but before I do, I'm going to read out a tweet from, I'm going to say this very carefully, the Good Grind, not Grinder, Good Grind Coffee Company, um, who say, 
We're a month into our new venture, running a speciality coffee van at Rayleigh Station in Essex. Tough first month with the rail strikes, timing is everything, bad weather and Christmas, but I'm optimistic about the year ahead, and I'm fully behind the striking workers, despite its effect on my business. And... Th- Craig, this is interesting. I think these these micro businesses that are springing up all over the place, and th- this happened, I think, as Emma said, during COVID, where because people were working from home, you you would have sandwich vans going round villages, and th- these are things that would never have happened before COVID. So, out of every threat, there's an opportunity, isn't there? I, lo- I love that story. Yes, and actually, what we saw with our data is uh, there was a lot of people uh, who were very let down because they missed the footfall in corporate centres in London, etc. And that was sandwich shops, that was vans. But what then happened was you saw local high streets across the country actually do pretty well. It didn't fit with the kind of narrative of the time, but you saw more people who were staying at home and then popping to somewhere which they hadn't visited. They'd lived there for years and hadn't visited and they would go and then you build up a new habit. Perhaps that was Joe in the... No, that's not a local small (laughs) business, but, you know, after your sixth visit... You were loving it. Um, maybe if that was a local small business as well, you know, there, there was we saw that. So I think if you look forward, any change provides an opportunity. And I think people will spot new ones. Uh, just on, do you want me to just touch on employment if yeah, possible? So, I mean, I think um, your caller's point is a very good one. It's incredibly tight labour market. And we've got a record number of people in employment and a record number of vacancies. I think that's going to change over the year. I think um, it'll be less pressured. I think a few businesses will go under, as we know, but that does create traction. And this is not a good thing, but it creates traction, it creates impact, it it creates opportunities, people have a new idea, people move on from their job and they set something up. So I think this churn, that's probably the wrong word, but... uh, Well, it's uh, a cycle of life, really, but in business. A bit of fizz. There will be new things. Uh, And I think the one group that we really should think about are those who are furthest from work. So either they are disabled, either they've never thought about work, or maybe that they are, they've come out from the pandemic and they've left and they've, the expectations of work are different. That's the that's the place where we should all be looking because they have talent, they have intelligence, and they can bring brand in, and, well, and they're not being tapped. And also, moment. I think the government have launched an initi- initiative this week about yes. getting over 50s back into work. Yes. People who may have thought, well, maybe they reevaluated their lives after COVID or whatever. Um, and there's a huge bunch of uh, people there who could be attracted back into work in the right circumstances. Driven by, but, I think, a lot of anti-ageism. Oh, you yeah. know, you used to be mm. a bit tricky to get a job at that point. Now, you know, now actually you're absolutely crucial to the workforce. And, th- and there is an increasing look at things like the menopause, for example, as well. I'm bringing people back, um, you know, employers turning around and saying, actually, I need to make my my employment positive for different people. I can't just think of this as a standard, boring thing, for the same for everybody. Mm. And I think that whole wellness agenda comes and brings up advantages and opportunities as well. Anyway, if you commute from Rayleigh in Essex... I'm going. Do go and get a cup of coffee from, what is it, Good Grimes? Gr- I hope grind. they have almond milk or I'd, something. I'd like to dairy. offer... Uh, if you mention my name, I'm sure they'll give you 10% off your first <laughs> cup. I'd like to make that an offer, but obviously I can't because I haven't discussed it with them. Anyway, I'm sure it's going to be a great business. John, on the other hand, says, as from April 2023, I will give up my gardening business. This is due to the ULES charge coming in August. My 2016 Citroen van is non-compliant. The government encouraged encouraged me to go diesel. Now I'm the devil. This government could not run a bath. Well, to be fair, this is Sadiq Khan is to blame for this. It's not the government. I'm cross with him too, by the way. I mean, I've heard so many stories of people, particularly who live on the edge, who have to go sort of backwards and forwards in a very simple similar state to John. And let's face it, I mean, if you, if you want to start a new business, I would say a gardening business nowadays, particularly, shall we say, in the leafier areas of the country, you're, you're going to make a good profit on the, on those because you can't get any... I mean, I, I tried to get someone to do something, was it last year or the year before? Could not find anyone. Same here. Yeah. I might just so. move house and have a garden that's a bit of a mess. Any so gardens in Tunbridge Wells, let me know. There's yeah. some work for you. Anyway, we've got uh, another half an hour to go with Emma Sinclair and Craig Beaumont taking your calls. Some really good calls coming in. 0345 6060 973. Then after nine, we're going to ask, should drinking be banned on flights? It's 8.31 on RBC. Let's get the latest news headlines from Daryl Jackson. There's mixed news about public sector strikes this evening with positive sounds coming from rail talks. The RMT and the group representing train operators say they're working together on a revised pay offer. But more than 70,000 staff at universities across the UK will strike for 18 days between February and March. 
Classified documents from the Obama administration have been found in President Joe Biden's garage. It's the second discovery of its kind. A special lawyer has been appointed to investigate. And the King and the Prince and Princess of Wales have all ignored questions about Prince Harry's book. They've been on their first public engagement since the memoir's release. LBC weather, cloudy and wet for much of Scotland, Northern Ireland, Northern England and parts of Wales tonight. Drier towards the south and lows of three. This is LBC. This is LBC with Ian Dale. Call 0345 6060 973. 8.35. Uh, loving watching LBC on Global Player with Craig Beaumont and Emma Sinclair. That's from Nikki Larkin, who is a For The Many podcast super fan, so I give her name in full. And, and as she says, you can watch us on Global Player. Right, we have Emma Sinclair from Enterprise Alumni and Craig Beaumont from the Federation of Small Businesses. We're talking about the challenges and opportunities facing small businesses in 2023. Um, Simon is not from Rayleigh in Essex. He's from Lee-on-Sea. Emma, you can go on a tour. I'm going on a British tour for 10% discounts with <laughs> you, Ian. Now, yeah, now uh, Simon, what would you like to ask? Oh, I've got loads of questions, Ian. Um, but uh, I'll stick with one. What, what, do the, what do the panel define as a small business? Now, that's a good question. Well, well let's leave this here. to the experts, shall we, the, from the Federation of Small <laughs> Businesses. What, what counts as small? One to how many? It's one to 50 is, is small, but that includes micros, which is one, one to 10. That's the official definition. There is a second one based on turnover. No one uses it. Uh, it's all based on employee numbers. So if you're self-employed and you have no employees, you count. That, that all adds up to the five million. So, okay, because okay, you just described me there. All right, what so do you do? I'm a, I'm a barber. I've spoke to Ian before, but he's no good for business. No, so no, no. Ten percent discount. Well, much but, out uh, of me. But I know some gardeners, Ian. I know some gardeners. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, ba- basically, um, I was listening to Grant Shapps the other day, and what I, what I don't understand is, is with my business, I've got a turnover of, of less than forty five thousand a year. Um, I'm, not, I'm a village barber. I'm, I, I've got a barbers in a place called Great Wakerin, which is sort of out on the outskirts of. Uh, South End. Um, it's a small community. Um, I've got 
a lot, lot of overheads. But for my electricity, I had to, my choices were a one year, a two year, or a three year fixed deal. If I didn't take one of them last October, um, I went on to an emergency tariff, which was dearer than all of them. Yeah. So I ended up fixing my tariff at 60 pence a unit from 18 pence a unit. And my daily charge went from 20 pence a unit to 51 pence a day. So, and I'm now fixed for two years. And I'm listening to him talking about taking away help and saying that, you know, the wholesale price is coming down. That doesn't make any difference to a business like mine at all because I'm fixed at a set price. And I don't have the option on the size of my business of challenging those companies or pulling out of contracts. And that. I, I am held to whatever they say was available at the time. I shipped around. That was the best I could do. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. They, they, they encourage people to fix. Government said that. Um, and at the time, the variable tariff, the one that you would have moved on to, was much, much higher than all the fixed deals. It was 90 so, pence a yeah. unit. I had a choice of 60p or 90p. That was my choices. Yeah, so I don't know if you used a broker. Yes, I did, yeah. Now, so there's, there's new rights that have come in from December about people, uh, micro-businesses, i.e. 10 or below, that have used a broker to find their energy. So if your broker does anything weird, you are now able to go and uh, appeal to an ombudsman. That won't help you with the full cost. I'm just saying, if, if you find out later that they haven't given you all the information you need... Well, the, the, pro- the, support. the problem is that I'm fixed for two years, as of uh, later last year, and if the wholesale price comes down, everyone else has got an advantage right. over me. Well, you know, so, so uh, and, and I, I'm a one man band. Um, you know, the law for me was you either have an emergency contract, which you can't afford, or you sign up to and, something. And how I much? Was, I'm with British Gas. How much so roughly trebled? Per, how much per month are you paying for your energy costs? Well, my my isn't excessive, but it's it's relative to the size of my business and my prices. Mm. So it, it, it's. You know, if I'm paying £100 a month, it's now £300 a month. Yeah. Emma? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, Simon... I, I, can't, I can't do any more ve- haircuts. Very and hard. I, I, my only option is to put prices up, which I can't do, because then you lose people well, or they don't come as often. We've only got a couple of seconds, but maybe I give you two points. One of them is you should tell that to your customers and say, if you can, I'd really like you to pay me 25% more to help me cover that. And I bet you yeah. that a chunk of your customers would do that, especially the loyal ones. If you asked me that and you cut my hair and I could afford it, I'd do that. And at the opposite end of that, I know you said you can't challenge it. I mean, uh, whilst, I'm also, whilst I'm an optimist, relentlessly, I'm also a challenger, relentlessly. Yeah. Why can't you challenge it? Yes, you absolutely can. The amount of times I've tweeted... I. I get that I have a lot of Twitter followers, but the amount of times I've tweeted Me something I think is unreasonable. British, I just don't see well, that as a, I mean, you can't even get through after time, let alone get someone that's going to be able have to Have a go at Twitter. Like have a go at Twitter. Tweet us tonight. We've all been on the show. Say it doesn't okay. feel fair. I feel misled. What can you do to help me? That, I, that is an interesting point using Twitter because, and I've, I have found quite often that if somebody does that and they at me or maybe you in a complaint, you'd be surprised at how these company, these big companies do not like that kind of attention and, and it makes them jump. I just say that for what it's worth. Mm. We've, I, we've, I, I say that from experience. Yeah. So that's why I suggested it, Simon. Yeah. I know you don't have to be the world's most prolific. And also business, that's OK. It's okay. I know you say you can't, but it's not actually a giant. And actually, they'll, they'll know full well that they have customers that got tied into something that doesn't make sense. And I bet that there are people looking at that. So I'd say, first of all, you don't know until you have a try. So do have a go at that as well, Simon. Maybe write a little leaflet that you give to your customers as they come in and you can sort of say in it, look, I don't want to ask you this personally, but this is the situation. Not going to hold it against you if you don't want to pay a little bit more, but it would really help. It's no, nobody's going to think worse of you for doing that. If you can. Can I, can I just add on one thing, which is don't give up? Um, because I, I think there is a, lo- a huge push at the six top energy companies. We've written to all six with a list of things that they can do to help small businesses, like don't disconnect them, help them with their, with their ears, cap your standing charges, no upfront deposits, a list of things, and they're all going to have to come back. And the Chancellor adopted those on Monday quietly and demanded an answer by March the 15th. And it's not bad so, for their businesses, right? We want those businesses to carry on. We, electricity we, businesses, we you need, mean? Or? Look, if you make a deal with somebody, you need to try and keep it, and generally you should keep it. But in in circumstances that are slightly extraordinary, people bend for all kinds. Whether the reason is for, mm-hmm. is for the and brand. Sometimes you have to shame big companies into doing the right thing, and very often 
They will. I was listening to my, my favourite podcast is one called The Price of Football. And it's all about the financing of football. Might sound a bit boring, but it's really interesting. Kevin Day, the comedian, hosts it. Kira Maguire, professor of something or other at Liverpool University. And it's sort of quite amusing in some ways. And they shamed Manchester United into paying all of their staff the living wage. And it was l- relentless. And in the end, they got a phone call from Manchester United saying, OK, OK. Yeah, you, be an you, activist. We, we hear, we hear you. We're, go, we're going to do it. And that is where you can pressure people into doing these things. But there's a positive one as well, because one of the energy companies, I can't say who it is, uh, because of this push, because of this need, is setting up a hardship fund. So there will be a fund set up to help small businesses in trouble. I can't say who it is, but when they do that, well, the others, we? because it hasn't been confirmed oh, or written, okay. but, but, but when they announce it, <laughs> well, it hopefully would, soon... I bet it's confirmed it, if you say it on it the will, radio. It will, <laughs> I'm be in trouble. Uh, it, it will spread. If that is confirmed, that will spread, because you have, as you as you both know, you, there's competition. So as one, yeah. as one energy provider does it, Bit the other five... Right, follow. Simon, good call. Thank you very much. Let's go to Tom, who's first time caller in Southampton, not Essex. Hello, Tom. Hi, Ian. Thank you very much for taking my call. What would you like to say? Um, it's just really a bit of a success story. So we started up our company um, two years ago in March. Um, we actually um, run a valeting, mobile valeting and detailing uh, business, which we founded... For cars. Uh, for cars, um, anything with wheels, really. Cars, yeah. motorbikes, caravans. Do you have a branch in Tunbridge Wells? Uh, no, just... Uh, Ian and I are really ready for pitching we for all these things. If we, you've got to open Tunbridge Wells we in North West London, we're in. We want to support the economy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we actually founded the company um, after my wife and I lost our son uh, back in 2020. Um, and the business has gone from strength to strength, really. Um our biggest issue at the moment is the cost of diesel and petrol for our generators, which give us our electric when we're at customers' addresses. Um, and the next biggest hurdle we're finding at the moment is we're actually trying to expand the business and being able to find ways of being supported as a small business to expand to enable us to take members of staff on board. Do you mean getting money. getting money basically to yes. expand um, customers? So um, getting expansion funds, capital. Um, capital on board that we can actually say, right, let's go and buy another vehicle rather than having to put clients off. I mean, yeah. at the moment we've got a client waiting list of up to four months for new clients. How many customers have you got, Tom? Um, so at the moment, private clients. Um, we've got just over 120 on our books. Sounds like you need to do a little crowdfund. Something like I'm always thinking, what's the solution? I mean, you got you know expansion capital. There's banks. There's debt. There's asking your neighbour. Banks someone. are not interested, are they? No, there's, I think they're unless, a ter- unless you've got no. total security, they're not interested in risk. There's tertiary that, banks, the but thing I agree. With the banks is we they they just won't entertain us because no. we're such a small company and we're newly established. Yes, we can show them all the figures that we've got. And they kind of just, I'll oh, come back to us in 12 months and we'll have a look at it again. Tom, if I may, yes. everyone's you know, always got a piece of advice and always like, God, if you're in my shoes. I mean, I really have been in your shoes. I've started all my businesses myself and didn't have any money. First of all, you've got over 100 customers and a long waiting list. Sounds like you should do a crowdfund. You, you, you know, it's extremely sorry to hear the motivation for why you started your business. I bet you've got former colleagues and friends that might want to support you. Friends and family, mm-hmm. raising money from friends and family. If what you need for expansion capital is to buy another vehicle, actually, that's not a million pounds. That's not. You don't achievable. actually need to buy it either. No, there's all kinds of things to be done there. So it sounds to me you've got a great business, a long waiting list, customers that love you, people that want you. And also, for the people that are on your waiting list, great. Do you know what? If you want to skip the waiting list, you've got to pay triple. Maybe something like that. There's all kinds of things you can do there. I mean, how exciting, Tom. That's, that's yeah, exciting. Yeah. There's a good problems that you have. It's, it is good problems, and it's nice to hear some feedback like that. And unfortunately, as a small business, we there's nowhere we can go to speak to people and to give us that feedback and guide us in the direction that well, we actually... Well, if you do a crowdfund, tag me, and I'll, and I'll okay. put a little tiny bit in and just start it off. Go on. That sounds great. Great problems to have, Tom. And in terms of you say, so you need a van to basically visit people at their own homes. It doesn't have to be a new van. It doesn't have to be an expensive van. Presumably, you can you can uh, sort of put a, a couple of thousand down and then pay a monthly fee. I mean, there are all sorts. There are many ways to skin a cat, Tom. I'd have thought. Yes, yeah, so I mean, we've looked at um, financing it, leasing it again. 
because we are a newly established business... Go to a small um, car dealer. Fi- Don't go to the really big companies ones. Companies won't look at us and give us sort of the funding that we need to enable us to purchase this. If this you've second you've been going for two years, you've yes. got you've got a trading record. You're you're not a startup. You ought to be able to find somebody. Uh, you're not asking for a huge amount of money. There are people mm. out there. There are different sort of lending organisations for small businesses mm. that will look at you if you've got a bit of a trading record. So I, I think you just need to expand your horizons a bit on that. Sounds like an optimist. That's an optimistic call, Tom. I, yeah. I do these, have these conversations all day long with people. Those are all good problems. I know that you're going to be able to get another vehicle. And the finance market is coming back. It kind of froze a bit during COVID and because it was all about bounce back loans and that kind of thing. But now the non-traditional lending market is beginning to come back. The new seed investments beginning to come back. And if the government's really going to do what it promises, which is look at investment, how to make business investment improve, the way to that for small business is to think about people like you. How do you, how do we get you to invest in that van? What yeah. can be done? Um, great stuff, Tom. Thank you very much. It's 8.48. LBC. Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. It's 10 to 9 on LBC. I've really enjoyed this discussion. It really makes me think we should be doing a business hour more often. Yes. Uh, just need to find a sponsor now. Uh, right, let's go to Lorraine, who's a first-time caller in Barnet. Hello, Lorraine. Hi, Ian. Pleasure to be on the programme, and I am a avid listener of LBC Radio. Fantastic. Um, and I wanted to uh, share a positive story because you were asking, you know, people to call in who've had a positive experience. And so my experience is that uh, I was working as a face-to-face counsellor before um, the pandemic. And when the pandemic hit, uh, obviously I couldn't see clients face-to-face. So what I did was I invested in an online marketing course. And this is why I wanted to call in because I... It opened up a whole world for me, which has ended up with me making more money now than I ever was when I was doing face-to-face. And I'm learning from all these wonderful young people about online marketing, and I I just don't hear this talked about very much, you know, about the the huge market, the international market. I have clients now 
in America, in Germany, in Australia, in the, in the Far East. And I just don't hear a lot of people talking about this. And I, um, so I wanted to just share that experience with you. Emma? First of all, Lorraine, congratulations. That's so exciting. And sometimes we all need a push. Sometimes the push is a friend or something really positive. Unfortunately, sometimes, like for you, it was the pandemic, but it forced you to do something new and different, to reframe what you do, um, and obviously to have this new success. And I guess the important thing about you calling in, if I think about people that might be listening, or if I'd listened to you say that when I was thinking of starting my first business, is it can be really daunting. The digital world, I don't know how to do that. I've never done that before, which I'm guessing is, is, is where you were, given what you were doing for a living beforehand. But if you, there is so much free advice out there courses uh, online courses mini courses you know you can reach people on linkedin twitter instagram you just have you to ask go questions to, to, to youtube you know yeah, there, yeah. anything you want to know i mean the, what's I mean, an inspiration I'm, lorraine i'm 69 wow. and so you know hands up the, the digital processes you know are, are really a, a tough to get my head around and I have I'm very slow and I'm often on you know marketing calls with all these wonderful young people and I'm the kind of grandmother there who's like, but that's okay, a great market Lorraine right but if you know how to do these things and you're and you're a completely different demographic there's an enormous demographic of people of people who need someone like you where you will appeal to them probably more than a 22 year old so phenomenal Lorraine thank you very much let's move on to Bob who is in Harrow hello Bob Hi, Ian. Thanks for having me back on. Just listening to your callers, there's one common theme that comes through. That's triumph over adversity. Mm. Um, you know, with, with, with the gentleman with his transport business and, and, and the barber with these great overheads. I thought it's a fantastic pun, a barber with great overheads. Perhaps, <laughs> but perhaps he needs crown funding. Oh, dear. Sorry, that's terrible. But moving on to the point right. I want to make. I'm, I'm, I'm going to cut you off for that one. Oh, please don't. <laughs> Right. The, the point I want to make is uh, we're looking after the Ukrainian family. They're Western-looking, dynamic, and I've learned such a lot from them. Again, the theme of triumph over adversity. And one thing that came out, Ian, was that the cost of energy, heat rakes, gas, electric, is actually cheaper in Ukraine than it is here in the UK. Their yeah, but you can't get it all the time, though. No, their energy infrastructure has been destroyed, and they found ways of producing energy electricity through portable generators and I think this is one thing that we're learning from in this country. When the war finishes for all the business people out there and the small business owners, there are going to be tremendous opportunities available to us. But I don't want to say that they were going to benefit or profit from a war. There are going to be casualties. There are going to be so many opportunities in rehabilitation and everything that follows a war if we look at all the wars that this country has gone through and suffered from. But that's the only point I'm wanting to make. Whenever well, there's adversity, we will triumph. Yeah. Uh, and I suspect Ukrainians will remember who their friends were when it's all over. Craig? I was going to add that. Actually, you can add a net zero point to this. We know lo- loads of small businesses have, who've managed to work out you know, how to go about micro-generation, con- contributing to their own energy needs, contributing to the national grid, although the subsidy there has gone as well. Um, but they're still getting there and doing it. And I think this whole idea of transformation uh, from the previous caller Lorraine as well, taking an opportunity, seeing it, running for it, making the most of it maybe failing a couple of points but then moving on i think that is the small business journey and i love hearing about it the, the idea of someone being a face-to-face counselor for the ma- vast majority of their working life and at the end suddenly switching and then it all taking off i think that's a great story how wonderful he was hosting is still hosting a ukrainian family Indeed. wonderful Bob. Uh, dakota is in sydenham hello dakota hello how are you doing very well what would you like to ask um, yeah, I just wanted a little bit of advice, really. So I'm a new startup company. Uh, I literally registered the company name last week. Um, it's that new. Um, nowadays, it is so hard to start up a business, especially when you're not getting support from banks and, and things like that because of you know the financial crisis. Um, so I'm going into like the coach industry, like buses, coaches. Um, I'm, I'm disabled myself, so I've, I have found it quite a struggle uh, to get started up. Um, but then on top of that, I've put myself through um, a transport manager qualification, which is incredibly hard to get um, to get this business started. But now I'm finding the pitfalls of the finances. Um, so I just wanted a little bit of advice, really. What, what's your main barrier? Money. It's just finding the money. Um, with coaches, you're looking at quite a lot of money, 50, mm. 60K, if not more. But you presumably knew that when, when you did your business plan. 
I did, yes. And I, I was hoping there would have been a little bit more support with banks, things like that. Um, but then I'm finding that they, they do kind of turn a blind eye to it. Where can you go, Emma? Well, before we go to where you can go, a couple of quick things. Dakota, congratulations on your enthusiasm and energy and, and the, the registering the name. Um, you said Thank nowadays you. it's so hard to start a business. And honestly, and I've been doing this quite a long time now, I think as every year goes by, I think it gets easier. When I started, there was no LinkedIn advice. Uh, there was there was just none of the resource that's available now. So actually, I'd have to say, maybe where you are, you hadn't been exposed to that and maybe hadn't seen some of the places you can go. But first of all, for those people listening, I, th- I think it's actually much, much easier. The second thing is, you know, when you start a business, you might do a business plan, but you, you mentioned you knew you were going to need the money. Yeah. The thing about starting a business is there's a hundred things you don't know that are going to cause a problem. But if there are a hundred things you do know before you start it, especially yeah. if it's something big like money, you know, it's one of those things that you really have to look into and at the right time. If it's that you have to carry on working elsewhere for another two years so that you have a deposit for something you need, that's what I did. Um, mm-hmm. you, you know, when you say the banks are turning a blind eye, now, look, I personally speaking, I'd love everybody that wants to start a business to get the money because how wonderful would that be? But that's not that's not the reality, really, of how these things work because if you borrow money from someone and you can't pay it back and they've given it to you recklessly um, without doing their homework, it's tricky. You've obviously got no track record. So the question becomes, you know, how can you make this possible? So my advice to you would be, if you can't get the money for it just now, keep doing mm-hmm. what you're doing, work out how to save for it, make a plan. If it takes two weeks or two years... If that's what entrepreneurs do, Dakota, that's what I did. Everything is hard. The word business, I always say the word business actually translates as problems and hard. And, and there are business loans that you can get through various government schemes as well, we should say. And, and you can reach out to people as well. My advice on top of that would be say don't, don't sit there and worry about it. Go out and talk to people. Yeah. You've got professionals that you work with, your accountant, FSB if we're there, if you're locally as well, go in, just go in and talk to people. The door is open. We have to quit there, I'm afraid, because we've reached the end of the hour. Apologies to uh, Richard, to Rob, to Uh, Linda to Angelo Sandra James and many others who we haven't had time to fit in promise we're going to do this again very very soon so to Craig Beaumont to Emma Sinclair thank you very much indeed for joining us now after nine we are going to change the subject we're going to be talking about the fact that the blue singer Lee Ryan has been convicted of the racially aggravated assault of a flight cabin crew member now basically it's all down to drink And the question I'm going to ask you in this hour is, should drink, should alcoholic drinks be banned on aeroplanes? What have been your experiences um, in uh, on flights and maybe in airports as well? Because apparently Lee Ryan drank a bottle of port in an airport lounge, uh, but was still allowed on the plane. What have been your experiences? 0345 6060 973. That's the number to call here on RBC. On your radio, on Global Player, and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From 